Well, John, thank you very much for joining us. And, My pleasure. Uh, very interesting book here, Stewardship Lessons Learned from the Lost Culture of Wall Street, which we'll be discussing in a moment. Uh, but first, how did a Taft end up on Wall Street? You've had attorney generals, Supreme Court justice, uh, chief justice, former president, numerous uh, senators, it seems, congressmen, governor, everything else, academicians, physicists. How Wall Street? <laughs> well, that's a question that my father would have loved me to answer. He passed away before I could. But um, he was a physicist, and he was the dean of Yale College. And he was, like many academics, believed that if you spent one minute a day worrying about money, you had wasted your day. But the short answer, and it really, it really gets to why I wrote the book, is that I do have in my family a legacy of public service. And I did feel that in joining the investment banking firm that I joined uh, after getting out of business school, that I was doing my part to leave the world a better place. I had been a newspaper reporter, and I covered the rebuilding of an industrial city in northeastern Massachusetts, Lowell, Lowell. Massachusetts. And that's what I wanted to do. So I went back and got a graduate degree and went to work in public finance, raising money for state and local governments to build public projects, you know, help uh, finance schools, uh, build con uh, convention centers, that type of thing. And I felt that in doing that for state and local governments, not profit entities, I was doing my part to serve the world. That's an antiquated and uh, uh, notion right now, and one that unfortunately has been discredited by behavior on Wall Street over the last several years. But the whole general thing about commerce is overlooked, that you only succeed by meeting the needs and wants of other people. Well, I think that's exactly right. The, again, that seems markets. to be, yeah, it seems to be an antiquated notion these days almost, but doing well by serving your clients is in fact a time-tested formula that we need to get back to and reconnect with. Now, you're CEO of RBC Wealth Management. You have, uh, what, 235 plus billion under your uh, stewardship. And uh, how do you differentiate your shop from others who are in uh, wealth management? Well, one of the... What are the things that, uh, tangible or intangible, that you think mark you as not just another? Yeah, well, one of the dirty little secrets in our industry is that it is very hard to differentiate one wealth management firm from another. But here are a couple of things that, that we bring to the table. First of all, we're owned by a Canadian bank. And the Canadian banking system turned out to be really the only model during the financial crisis of a developed nation's banking system that could actually show resilience and withstand what happened in 2008 and 2009. So at this time, when people are still you know, rebuilding from the trauma of 2008 and 2009, safety, stability, Canada, Canadian banking, those are all attributes that are important to our clients because don't forget the, the fundamental product of a wealth management business is creating a state of um, ease, peace of mind in our Sle clients. Sleeping at night. Sleeping at night. And you can't do that if the firm you work for is in the newspapers every day. Secondly, there is no way to manage wealth uh, whether 250,000 or 250 million dollars of wealth other than focusing on the individual circumstances of the person you're trying to help. So bringing individualized attention to investors whose lives are complicated and it doesn't take very much money to have a complicated life is one of the things we try to do better than anyone else. So how do you avoid the cookie cutter approach that people often sink into? Well, one of the business models <clears throat> that has been maligned over the last several years is the what used to be called the retail brokerage model and is now called the comprehensive wealth management model. <laughs> Amazing <laughs> what rebranding will do. But the point is that the, the only way to deliver wealth management advice in a customized way 
to individual clients is through you know, literally armies of advisors who are willing to invest time in getting to know their clients, emotional state, and personal circumstances so that they're then able to put together a plan and pull off the shelf the right products and services that make sense for that client. And it's, it's, it's door to door, it's literally at the kitchen table, so you have to do it through what the consultants call a decentralized advice model, and that's what the wealth management business I run is. Perhaps doesn't go quite as far as the legend about uh, Morgan decades ago that they'd walk your dogs as part of the services they provided. Well, it doesn't go that far, <laughs> but it goes, uh, there are other examples of that. That's exactly right. Um, what, whatever it takes to become a trusted advisor to the client, because ultimately that's what you're selling. Take the worries off the client's shoulders and onto yours. Now, uh, getting, getting back to your book, about a year old now, uh, Wall Street. We all know the <coughs> charges against it, lack of trust, speculation, obscene bonuses, bad behavior, LIBOR scandals, which is commercial banking, but part, part of the indictment, front running, lack of a moral compass, unhinged. Uh, first, why do you think the mania happened? And uh, what, what time period do you think this uh, decline began? And uh, and we'll get into where you see it today. Right. The, the, well, first of all, you need to um, recognize that what happened on Wall Street was you know, simply an important, but was one area where excesses built up leading to the financial crisis. But um, you can look from the 1990s up until 2008 and 2009 at the share of GDP that was represented by the financial services industry. And over that period of time, it doubled. It doubled as major financial institutions looked to boost their returns on equity by putting more and more illiquid assets on their balance sheets and leveraging up with more and more leverage. So why did that happen? Well, I think, and the premise of my book is, that we lost touch with our purpose, our mission, in our role in society. We are supposed to serve an intermediary role. We're supposed to connect up people who have money with people who need money, do it in a way that capital is efficiently allocated, manage the risks involved in doing that so that the economy grows at an optimal rate. In other words, we are a means to greater ends. What we lost sight of was that particular role, and we started thinking of ourselves as an end unto ourselves, stopped focusing on our clients and on serving our clients, and started focusing on too much on making money for the institution, its shareholders, and its employees. And that led to a bunch of behavior that played no particularly socially important role. And those activities are what got us in trouble. Would you uh, say this is in part caused by Wall Street going from partnerships to uh, shareholders? <coughs> so uh, you, if you're speculating, it was your money that was being speculated with? I, I am someone who believes that the, the asymmetric reward system that goes with corporate structure played a role in the kind of behaviors that we saw on Wall Street. And you're absolutely right. When Financial services firms were partnerships. The partners actually wrote a check, put money out of their pockets into the businesses. They could lose that money or they could make more money on that investment. Well, today, that doesn't happen very often, if, if at all. What happens is an executive comes into the financial institution. They're given a set of incentives. The incentives either appreciate in value or they remain at zero value. But in any event, there's no downside risk to the employee. So with that kind of asymmetric reward system, what are you incented to do? You're incented to take risks in the, in the service of trying to grow whatever corporate metric is tied to your compensation. I do think that played a role. Some would uh, say what we used to call go-go banking began back in the 1960s uh, with the city doing things that uh, banks had not traditionally done. Do you think there's anything to that? And then it spilled over into Wall Street? Well, I'm not someone who thinks that you, know, you should bring back 
Glass-Steagall or ring fence the bank. I do believe that, you know, the point that Jamie Diamond makes, it's a head of J.P. Morgan, which is that in an era where you have global corporations, you need global financial institutions to serve their needs. I, I think that's real. In any event, I think it's a fantasy to think you're going to break up or roll back the evolution of banking. So I don't think that necessarily led to um, the kinds of excesses you've seen. Again, I would point to the Canadian banking experience as an example of the fact that you can have very large and very concentrated banking institutions that still behave responsibly. We keep hearing about too big to fail. Well, in the Canadian economy, there are six banks that matter. The Canadian banking system is all about too big to fail, and yet none of them failed. None of them even cut their dividends, and they all performed uh, well and made money throughout the crisis. So what was different? Not the structure of the industry, but the behavior of people inside it. We'll touch on the Canada in just a moment, but uh, in terms of uh, Wall Street, uh, hasn't Wall Street gone off the uh, rails before the 1920s or the 1960s, talking about go-go years <coughs> where uh, things seem to change very radically? Yes, so much so that I've been uh, trying to write an article on uh, the whole issue of addictive systems. You know, uh, is there something about <laughs> the financial services industry that is an addictive system? And if so, what is the addiction? What is driving this, these cycles of bad behavior followed by contrition, followed by relapse, followed by contrition? I mean, it is it's been going on throughout history, so it probably has a lot to do with human nature. But yeah, it, it, is, it is a cyclical event, and um, this so time now, it was uh, as well. What changes have you seen? You talked about the CFAs come up with a list of 50. What changes have you seen or do you believe, as you said, uh, that uh, uh, Wall Street is chastened but not reformed? I, I, I do believe that some progress has been made, um, but I don't think we've solved the problem. The problem being the underlying culture of Wall Street, the financial services system, which as I say, should be all about serving clients and serving social goals, not just about making money. Um, but the kinds of things you're seeing are in part imposed from within. So you do have new leadership in many of the institutions and they are saying the right things. They're talking about you know, socially responsible and corporately responsible behaviors uh, in their business practices. You're seeing the marketplace impose some discipline. More and more money is being invested in corporations that demonstrate that they have a history of and processes in place to behave responsibly going forward. It's a whole uh, environmental, social, and governance movement. And then lastly, of course, the regulators are coming in, hammer and tong and they have put an entirely new regulatory infrastructure into place that includes much higher capital levels, lower leverage levels, tools for regulators to deal with non-banking institutions that they didn't have before, new centralized exchange and clearing mechanisms for the swaps and derivatives market, which was a source of multi-trillion dollar risk. There are new systemic risk oversight councils those are all things that didn't exist going into the crisis. So we've made progress, but when you come to Wall Street and sit down at a meeting, you know, what kind of a god is being worshipped? Is it a god of socially responsible behavior, or is it mammon? That, that's the question. Question you've dealt here and elsewhere, can you teach ethics? Very interesting question. The answer is yes and no. You can, um, the studies that have been done that I've read, mostly on ethical behavior in the professions, indicate that uh, you can induce what, what would be called a parallel shift in responsible behavior, i.e. you can raise the bar for everybody by training on and educating about ethical behavior. But what we call corporate cultures, is that? Well, corporate culture or continuing education for lawyers that actually have cases in them about, you know, 
what the right way to behave and the wrong way to behave as a, as a lawyer would be. But then, but the, the data again I've read is that the single biggest driver of what you might call moral capacity, the capacity to behave in a responsible way even if you don't, is how long have you been alive? How long have you been walking the planet? And what kinds of experiences have yeah. you had? There is no way a 30-year-old you know, recent graduate of a business school has the same moral capacity as a 65-year-old head of medicine at a teaching hospital. Doesn't happen. And one of the things that I'm wondering about, I haven't had anybody so, bite. So, so sounds like you're bringing a Confucian uh, culture here. Well, <laughs> well, one of the things I'm asking about, what's the last time you saw a 67-year-old head of statistical arbitrage trading on Wall Street? You haven't. They're 38 years old. So what kind of moral capacity does that 38-year-old have controlling $105 billion of corporate capital? Question. You know, so maybe we ought to provide incentives for people on Wall Street to stick around longer and make sure we have moral exemplars in place. You mentioned RBC, the Canadian, one of the big six up there. Uh, what can we learn from Canada? Uh, let's uh, first hit mortgages and then capital. Right. The, well, there would be three things to hit, I would think. One would be the technical um, um, features of the mortgage finance system in Canada, which unlike the United States, didn't overheat or hasn't yet. There's some concern it might be overheating up there now. But, um, and, and, and yet, not overheating was able to drive almost exactly the same incidence of housing ownership there as here. So no deductibility of mortgage interest and primarily no securitization of mortgages. In other words, every mortgage just about that's made in Canada is put on the balance sheet of the bank that originates the mortgage, meaning they pay attention to underwriting standards and because they're going to hold the loan through its term. Um, that meant that in Canada, mortgages were a source of earning strength to banks going into the crisis, not a source of toxic problems. Secondly, regulators seem to have a much better handle on how to manage the system. It's a principle-based regulatory system rather than a rules-based regulatory um, system. You, uh, I was going to do that a little later, but let's discuss okay. that now. You discussed uh, the Volcker rule, which sounds nice but impossible to uh, implement which underscores principle versus nitpicking rules. Explain the difference. Well, the Volcker rule would exactly be, uh, would it be a good example of that. So, uh, you know, the principle behind the Volcker rule is impossible to argue against, or <laughs> I haven't found anybody who will, is that banks shouldn't trade for their own account with capital that ultimately comes from deposits that are guaranteed by the federal government. So you can't do it. If you're going to accept those kinds of deposits, then you can't engage in proprietary trading. Makes a whole lot of sense. It turns out, however, that there's a lot of their difficulty in, in describing the difference between proprietary trading for one's own account and putting one's balance sheet at risk in the legitimate service of clients. If you're Goldman Sachs, and you get a call from PIMCO, and PIMCO says, I want to trade $10 billion in agency securities. Now, what's your price? Bang, you give them a price, you own $10 billion in government securities with no buyer on the other side, you have just gone along $10 billion in agency risk. You can make money, you can lose money. Now, that's a good thing, because you just added liquidity to the market, you served a legitimate market-making rule. So there are a couple of ways to, to then regulate if you put Volcker into place. One is to write a thousand pages of rules about what is and what isn't proprietary trading so that corporate lawyers can structure their way around it. And, you know, and the other one is just to say, look, if we find something that looks and smells like proprietary trading, not in the service of clients, we're going to come in and we're going to demand that you justify that activity to us. So don't do it. That would be principle-based as opposed to rules-based. And it turned out in Canada, the principles-based approach seemed to work better. And last thing in Canada, culture. There's a section in my book, there is no question 
I married a Canadian, spent much of my life in Canada. I am an American, descendant of American president. Your and great grandfather liked uh, Quebec. He lived there, had, la had land there. But there is a difference. And Canadian culture is better suited to stewardship behavior, in my, op in my opinion, than American culture. That's a gross generalization, but I, I'm as qualified to make it as anybody I know. Now, getting to the subject of capital, it seems that the whole thing of Dodd-Frank, talking about uh, rules versus <coughs> principle, uh, was trying to uh, regulate away risk uh, with uh, zillions of regulations that come out of that 2,700-page monstrosity. Wouldn't it just be simpler over time to uh, raise capital requirements and uh, leave it at that instead of trying to uh, nitpick everything and anticipate how much equity capital do you have? I, I agree with your statement. I'm, I'm one of these people who personally believes that getting capital levels right, i.e. higher than they've been in the past, and making sure that the valuation techniques when it comes to calculating how much capital you need, which gets to then what are the risk weightings of your assets and you know, the, the variability of your assets. So there's art and science on that side of the equation. But those two things put together probably address 90% of the problems we experienced in Dodd-Frank, oh, I mean in the financial crisis. All the other stuff is just a lot of littles. Some of it may be more harmful than helpful. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. Capital adequacy gets to a lot of ills. One of the things that uh, seems to hurt our system and Europe's system is pro-cyclical regulation. When times are good, they lower the requirements. <clears throat> when times are tough, they raise them, which accentuates uh, the, the cycle instead of being a counterweight to the cycle. Anything to that? I, I think that's exactly right. And what we're dealing with right now is that in the heat of the moment, you know, 2009, 2010, policymakers, so regulators and political leaders, made a decision to move chips from the growth side of the table to the safety and stability side of the table. Yes, recognizing that constraints on banking activity would prevent them from doing the kinds of things to promote economic growth. Yes, recognizing that increasing capital requirements would cause banks to cut back on some of the activities, all of that, but in the service of more safe, stable, secure banking system. But what's happened is that there haven't been one chip moved, two chips moved. There have been thousands, you know, maybe tens of thousands of chips moved and nobody's counting. So we don't know how much has been moved from growth side of the table to the safety and security side of the table. But you know, from having walked the earth <laughs> for as long as you have, that these kinds of th activities always overshoot. And we are in the process, having done some good things around raising capital levels, of overshooting. And, and there will have to be a period where we cut back on some of the requirements we're placing on financial institutions around the world. Um. On that, uh, talking about uh, principles, uh, fiduciary rule, fiduciary standards for uh, those who give personal uh, advice, market advice. Uh, we any closer to that now? <laughs> Unfortunately, three years after Dodd-Frank, the answer is not really. Uh, What's the argument against it? Well, there isn't a good one against it. In other words, the, again, like the Volcker rule, shouldn't everybody who provides advice to individuals about how to manage their wealth be held to the same standard, which is that they put their clients' interests first. And if they can, because there's a conflict, they have to disclose the conflict and the client needs to accept it. That's all a fiduciary standard says. That ought to be the umbrella standard for all investment professionals. The reason we haven't gotten there is that it's a complicated rule to write, and the SEC doesn't have resources, and it wasn't mandated by Dodd-Frank. It was permitted, not mandated. Secondly, 
there are increasing challenges because of this concern of how many chips are you moving from the growth side of the table to the safety and stability side that you have to subject all these new regulations to cost-benefit analysis. So that has caused regulators to be very careful in moving forward in new regulations. And lastly, there continues to be a faction in the industry that doesn't like the idea that this new standard could raise investor protection. Um, you know, personally, I think that's swimming against the tide. But uh, we're no closer, really, Steve, three years after Dodd-Frank, to having that rule in place. I have to ask you uh, on investing, why not indexing? Uh, we've discussed before the show Charlie Ellis, who uh, once observed that uh, for most of us who play tennis, we're never going to make it to Wimbledon, get over it, and focus, uh, just get the ball over the net not with a fancy shot, just get over the net uh, within the lines and you'll do better than uh, trying to uh, be what you're not. So should most investors go for a form of indexing? Most investors should have a portion, one might even go as far as say a substantial portion of their portfolios in indexed vehicles simply to get broad market exposure. But the idea, um, of, well first of all there are also, however, certain asset classes that are very inefficient, let's take the municipal bond market, mm -hmm. or let's take small cap stocks, where active management you know, can be demonstrated to add value over mere indexing. So those are candidates for active management. But the role of a financial advisor today isn't just anymore about investing. And so a lot of financial advisors do use ETFs and index funds. Because what a financial advisor does is sit down and most uh, good ones start just like a doctor would with a discovery process. You know, have you ever had allergies? Do you have a heart condition? Does your fa did your father or mother die of cancer? In other words, they do a discovery and then they use that to put together a plan for what their client ought to be doing with their wealth. Building an investment portfolio is only one part of that. There's will and estate planning. There's how are you borrowing money? How can you, you know, and for what purposes and most efficiently? And so the comprehensive wealth management process that individuals engage in with their advisors only has investing as a small part of it. But yes, index funds are recognized today by most advisors as a low cost way to get exposure to certain market segments. And fastest growing area in our books is ETFs. Uh, individuals have stayed out of the market, at least till very recently, because of uh, what's happened on Wall Street, and what's happened in recent years. Uh, does that argue for, uh, uh, even if you read about uh, flash crashes and all this other stuff, that if you just stay in the market, certainly with your retirement money, you'll do better than trying to time the thing or letting emotions rule you? What the worst thing an individual investor can do is try to time the market. They are notoriously very bad at it. Yes, you're much better off staying invested. And you know, study after study after study shows that you know, unless you have exposure to the equity markets, which is what scares everybody, there is really no way you're going to be able to achieve your long-term goals, which include, for most people, funding an indefinite liability stream, the costs of living during your retirement, for an indefinite period of time, the period you have yet to live. That is an extremely complex and difficult challenge. You can't do it without exposure to equities. And the irony is that individual investors who got out of the equity market into quote unquote safe investments, cash and bonds, are exposing themselves to significant risk, not just the risk of not achieving their plans, but interest rate risk, when and if rates go up, which is inevitable, and erosion of purchasing power at the rate of inflation every year, given the fact that returns on cash are zero. So there are as many risks embedded in that safe strategy as there are in an all equity strategy. Pick a strategy, stick with it, and don't, as you say, let emotions change your course. One final question. Uh, you were an assistant for the mayor of St. Yes. Paul, Minnesota. Any appetite for uh, oh. 
<laughs> going in the public square? Uh, I get asked weekly, <laughs> particularly having written a book on stewardship and given my family a legacy. Um, Steve, you, you come from an illustrious family. I'm very proud of my, um, my family heritage. I had nothing to do with it. I was born into it, but I'm proud of it. Um, on the other hand, you know, being proud of it, giving its due, is very different from letting it distort decisions that you make. So that's why you left Ohio? That's why I've never lived in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> and it's why I'm not in political office. I, I, I am civically engaged as a business person. I've already influenced a number of things I care deeply about. And for me, that's the way to make a difference in the world today quite frankly, more effectively than being in political office, which as far as I can see, is a recipe for frustration. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's the book, Stewardship. Be sure to get it. John, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Appreciate it.